A History of the Yoruba People. S. Adabanji Akindi. The Politics of Kingdom Rule. The Yoruba kingdoms came into existence during the long period of about six or seven centuries starting in about the 11th century. The present chapter will attempt to describe general trends and themes in their history, with the exception of the Oyoila Kingdom, in the period ending with 1800. From the 16th century, Oyoila achieved such successes that set it above the general family of Yoruba kingdoms and made its history a significant chapter in the history of the Yoruba people. Consequently, a subsequent chapter will be devoted to the outstanding history of the Oyoila Kingdom. Citizens of the Royal Cities The immediate, most visible, result of the creation of each kingdom was the emergence of the new king's city, Aluilade, which we shall here call the Royal City or Royal Town. In every kingdom, the Royal City amalgamated the populations of the pre-existing settlements and the immigrant founders of the kingdom. The most important consequence of the amalgamation was the almost sudden rise of a town of considerable population. From about the 11th century to about the 18th century, then, Yoruba people saw such significant centers of population springing up all over their homeland. As soon as one of these cities arose, inhabitants of settlements in the neighboring forests tended to migrate into it and thereby quickly increase its population. Usually, most of these people came as single families or lineages, but sometimes whole settlements moved. The total effect of all this was that the Yoruba became increasingly an urban dwelling people. Ultimately, they became the most urbanized people in the tropical African forests. How large in population the cities were by 1800 is indicated here and there in the traditions. As earlier pointed out, some scholars have estimated that at the peak of the growth of Ila Ife by the 13th or 14th century, its population was probably about 70,000. Oyo Ila would seem to have been more than twice that number by 1800. By 1800 also, some other Oyo towns, such as Ikoi, Igbon, Eresa, Igboho, ranked among the largest in Yoruba land. The cities that are reputed to have been the largest in Yoruba land outside the Oyo area namely Ilesa, Ijebu Ode, Ouipol, Owo, Odondo, Adu, Ekiti, Akure and Ikir reached the peak of their growth considerably later than Ila Ife. The fairly definite impression conveyed by the traditions is that, by about 1800, by which time Ila Ife's population had declined, some of these cities were larger than Ila Ife in population and physical size. Below the level of these largest cities, there were many royal towns of fairly large size all over the country Il in the Igbomina country, the Akiti towns of Otun, Ikol, Ara, Ijero and Afan, Idani in the Owo country, Ifwara, Ketu, Sabe, the Igba towns of Ido, Alugan, Kesi, and Ake. Royal towns of the Akoko country were generally small. Generally small too were those of western Yoruba land from the Igbado country westwards with the exception of Ketu, Sabe, and Ifanyan. However, the extension of the political dominance of Oyo Ila to these western regions in the 17th century and the coming of many Oyo settlers, boosted the population of some of the towns there especially Ketu, Ifanyan, and the Igbado towns of Ilaro and Ijana. In most cases, it would seem, the creation of the royal city was effected by destroying the pre-existing settlements and massing all their population and that of the immigrants together in one area, just as had happened in the case of Ila Ife. The founders of Ilesa destroyed many pre-existing settlements, and so did the founders of Owo through a long drawn-out war. In Ijebu Ode, however, Abanta and his followers simply took control of the places they founded, and then began to build the structures of one common city a palace, the king's marketplace, and city walls. The founders of the Adu kingdom under Awamaro and Akiti did much the same as Abanta. The old settlements here were stretched out around the foot of the Oloda rock. Awamaro left them where they were and settled his immigrant followers as a continuation of the chain around the foot of the rock. Then he established a palace and the king's marketplace, and began to build the city walls. Thus, as would be remembered from an earlier chapter, the population of each royal city or town was made up of many distinct segments many distinct old settlements each under its own ruler, and many distinct segments of the immigrant group, each under a sub-leader who accepted the leadership of the overall immigrant leader. In the new royal city or town, each of these segments settled as a quarter under its own leader as quarter chief, and they and their quarter chiefs acknowledged the overall leader of the immigrant group as king. Creating the Royal Government From the above steps, there followed the formulation of the system of royal government in the royal cities a process that was apparently made easy for most cities by the fact that the basic outlines of a Yoruba monarchical system had become generally familiar. The initial order of seniority among the quarter chiefs was based on various factors. In general, the leading chiefs of the largest quarters became, in principle, the most senior chiefs in the new kingdom. 
But in practice, almost in every kingdom, other factors influenced the order of seniority such as how high the ancestry of the new quarter chief had been in the place from which the immigrant group came, whether the new quarter chief had been, in his own right, a famous person before joining the migration, and how personally close to the new king the new quarter chief was. If, subsequently, a migrant group arrived to join the king's city, the king's council met to decide the appropriate slot in the whole system for the newly arriving immigrant leader. Over time, the king's council established lower chieftaincies for the streets of each quarter, to assist the quarter chief. A quarter chief could recommend to the king's government the creation of such a lower chieftaincy, and also recommend the lineage to be vested with it. Before we go any further with this description of the typical system of government of the Yoruba kingdoms, it is important to make the following notes. First, as earlier pointed out, the foundational model replicated from kingdom to kingdom was basically the same namely, the system that had evolved in the villages or settlements of the widespread Alu and Priyadudua times. However, circumstances and historical experiences varied from kingdom to kingdom and, consequently, the ultimate details of government came to vary in subtle ways from kingdom to kingdom. Secondly, it is also not possible to give accounts here of the many centuries of the gradual evolution of the system of government in all the kingdoms. For such in-depth accounts and descriptions, we must look to specific studies of each kingdom the type that, gratefully, we have in, among others, such works as Pemberton and Afa Lyon's joint book on the Ila Kingdom, Karen Barber's book on the Okaku Kingdom, and Alug Badian's work on the Owo Kingdom in addition, of course, to works by local historians and chroniclers. Only the briefest outline of the system in its ultimate maturity is presented here. The initial highest group of the quarter chiefs became the king's council, or inner council, and its membership usually numbered five, occasionally more, but hardly ever more than seven. In addition to providing leadership in their quarters, the members of the king's council met with the king daily in the palace, as the king and council, to take all decisions affecting the kingdom. The king and council also served as the kingdom's highest court of appeal. The king was prohibited from taking decisions of state outside this king and council, but all its decisions were presented to the people as the king's decisions. The highest council of state bore different names in different kingdoms, Alorimarun, Oyomasi, Ayer, etc., but its composition and functions were roughly the same in all kingdoms. The composition of this council was deemed as perpetual, the chieftaincies included in it could not, usually, be removed and the number of its members could not be increased or decreased without an exceptionally important decision of the council itself. Below this highest level of government, there were other important councils on which the other quarter chiefs served. Each of these met in the palace also, not every day but each on its traditionally appointed day of the week. The king's decisions on any matter were reported first to these meetings as appropriate and, at this level, they would be discussed and the message could be sent up to the king to modify them. When the king's decisions and orders had been thus formulated and finally settled, they were communicated to the populace through well-established channels. Usually, the simpler decisions and orders were announced to the people of the royal city through an official town crier who would go through the streets in the cool of the late evening, at short intervals strike a gong to attract attention, and then proclaim, The king, the owner of the world, greets you all, and says so and so. At the sound of the gong, the citizens would stop everything and listen, and when the announcement was completed, they would answer back from their homes, May the king's will be done. Besides this occasional process, royal decisions and orders in general reached the citizenry through the detailed and powerful channels laid out in the system. Each quarter chief informed meetings of the lower chiefs and lineage heads of his quarter, each lower chief informed meetings of the people of his street, each lineage head informed the meeting of his lineage compound. The high chief who served as the official liaison between the royal government and the bail, ruler or minor king, of a subordinate town or village informed the bail, and the processes carried out in the royal city were then replicated in the subordinate town or village. All the chiefs and officials involved in these processes also bore the very important responsibility of seeing to the implementation of the king's decisions and orders in their respective areas of authority. In addition to serving on the various councils of state and as the executive in their various spheres of authority, most highly placed chiefs also bore some executive responsibility in the kingdom at large. The most senior member of the king's council served as prime minister and was regarded as second in command in the kingdom. Holders of other titles served in lower, but important positions special friend of the king, liaison officer between the king and other organs of state, bearers of particular duties in the king's installation ceremonies, overseer of the palace, overseer of the marketplace, officer in charge of particular city gates, keeper of the king's regalia and crowns, officer in charge of the purse, etc. Of these various special functions, perhaps the most important was the selection of a new king. 
the monarchy was hereditary in the royal family, but, as earlier pointed out, all male members of that family, sons and grandsons of former kings, qualified to be selected as king. In general, the Yoruba people rejected the principle of primogeniture, automatic succession of a king by his oldest child, and even any succession of a king directly by his own biological son. In some kingdoms, this was carried so far that certain categories of a king's offspring were totally excluded from selection as king. For instance, at different points in the history of the kingdoms, it came to be laid down in the Adu, Ahidi, kingdom that the U.S. first son, titled Abalugba, could never be selected as Yui, and in the Oyoila kingdom that the Alafin's first son, titled Remo, could never be selected as Alafin. A small standing committee of the highest quarter chief served as the Council of Kingmakers. Selection by this body was always final, and any agitation after the selection was deemed an extremely high crime. While the Council of Kingmakers was still busy considering the candidates, however, its members could be lobbied by agents and supporters of the candidates and by other members of the public. But while the Council was obliged to keep itself open to the currents of opinion in the public, it owed the very critical responsibility of not letting any citizen have any idea how its mind was working. Its members were forbidden, on oath, to divulge its information even to members of their own families. For this reason, its members would reject no candidates' gifts or, if the decision were to accept no gifts, would reject gifts from all candidates and their agents. The level of accountability and discipline expected of the Council of Kingmakers was very high. And once the selection was made, the chosen prince was handed immediately to the officials and priests responsible for the first steps in the process of installation. Usually, most members of the public might not even be aware a king had been chosen until the heavily ritualized installation process had gone some way. Another small standing committee of high chiefs bore a responsibility that could occasionally be far from pleasant. The Yoruba system provided that a king could be removed if he habitually acted beyond the established controls on royal power, or if he made himself repulsive through greed, tyrannical tendencies or immorality. In such situations, a committee of the high chiefs existed to counsel, admonish or even rebuke the king in strict privacy. If the king would not mend his ways, the situation could develop to the point that this committee would bring the matter before the other councils of state as well as before the Ogboni, described in Chapter 4, and the decision could be taken to remove the king. Once, however, a Yoruba man had been installed king, he could never revert to ordinary citizenship in his kingdom or in any other kingdom. Deposition or exile was therefore not an option. The small committee of chiefs would approach him respectfully and urge him to go to sleep because the duties of kingship had become too burdensome for him. In some kingdoms they would present him with a covered empty calabash, in others a parrot's egg. All these symbols had only one meaning the king was being asked to remove himself with dignity by committing suicide, and he would do so. Briefing the incoming king about all this, and instructing and equipping him for it, was part of the process of installation. Usually, the new king lived in a special compound outside the palace for a few months for such briefing as well as for important rituals, while the palace was being prepared to receive him. All the chieftaincies touched upon above, from the very highest quarter chieftaincies to the lowest street chieftaincies, were, like the monarchy, hereditary in particular lineages. When the holder of any hereditary chieftaincy died, his lineage selected from among its members a suitable candidate for the king's government to accept and install. Being suitable meant that the candidate enjoyed strong support of his lineage and was adjudged by the king and his council as deserving of the position and as an asset to the interests of the kingdom. The use of selection in the appointment of public officials, kings and chiefs, usually meant that each Yoruba kingdom or community was served by very capable persons. To earn selection as a chief, for instance, one had to be strongly acceptable to one's lineage, be broadly respectable in the community, be a manifestly good manager of one's own nuclear family be a hard-working and achieving person. The selectors of kings looked for these same qualities in the princes, as well as for a modest yet princely bearing. In short, to be selected and inducted into the formal titled elite, the Yoruba person had to belong to an elite of character and personality. The extensive use of the hereditary principle, and its linkage with important public functions, tended generally to underpin stability in a Yoruba kingdom. It meant that, virtually in perpetuity, the same lineage gave the kingdom its prime minister or its special friend of the king, or its liaison officer between the king and other agencies of government, or the performer of a given function in the installation of the king, or one of the members of the council of kingmakers, or one of the members of the special committee of chiefs that could advise the king to go to sleep. 
Each lineage whose titled member held any such special functional position from generation to generation ended up acquiring an expertise for that function, a high sense of commitment to its demands, integrity and accountability in its performance, a sense of mission, and an aura of dignity. Cumulatively, this tended to impart a dignity and gravity to the functioning of the government and to the offices of state. It also safeguarded against errant and erratic functioning of the agencies of government. It preserved the internal, predictable, relationships essential to the orderly existence of the government and of society. Besides the hereditary titles, there were some titles that were not hereditary like those of the war chiefs, commanders of the citizen armies in time of war. Usually, the king's government appointed from the citizenry for these titles, men who had distinguished themselves in some way, an arrangement which usually produced very capable military commanders. Holders of military chieftaincies held their titles for life. Over this whole system, the Yoruba king Oroba reigned in every kingdom of the Yoruba people, surrounded unceasingly by grandeur, pomp and ceremony. To his subjects, he was so high above all humans that it was prohibited to call him by his personal name, instead, he and the high chiefs chose an appropriate cognomen for him some grand composition from the history or circumstance of their kingdom, or from their hopes for the new reign. In the various kingdoms and dialects, the Abai inexhaustible Ariki included countless names such as Ikji or Isa, companion or lieutenant or likeness of the gods, Alaya, owner of the world, Alice, owner of all power or authority, Agbogbomo Yekun, the all-powerful leopard that stalks the wicked and the lawless, and therefore the strength of the weak against the injustice of the strong. Iku, death that kills, so that society, and order in society, may live, and Bebei, father and mother for every one of his subjects. He was too much like a god to visit any private home or to be seen ordinarily in the streets, and if his natural parents were alive, he must never set eyes on them. He must never step on any floor that had not been broom swept that day, and he must drink or otherwise use only water that was freshly fetched from the springs that day. Those who fetched his water had to be unmarried young females and they had to do so naked and protected from meeting anybody on their way. Those who prepared his food did so under the strictest supervision. He must not be seen by anybody while he ate or drank. If he needed to drink when people were present, he must be screened off in the act. For his subjects, it was a great blessing to see their king on the few festivals when he ceremonially showed his person adorned, on his throne, in gorgeous clothes, and wearing the beaded crown with the dangling beaded frills veiling his face. If he graciously spoke to the assembled crowd, no citizen would hear his voice, one of the high chiefs would echo his words. On a daily basis, even the highest chiefs greeted the Oba on their knees before the throne, even if he was not there, and any citizen passing by the gate of the palace paid respect on bended knees. Universally, Yoruba people thought of the title of king as a title exclusively for men. In reality, however, many Yoruba kingdoms had women rulers in their history. An immigrant princess from Ife, a Detenran, was the founder of the Ila kingdom in the Igbamana country, and another woman founded the Odondo kingdom. The warlike kingdom of Ilesa had at least two women rulers Ye Ye Wei in about the late 15th century, and Oaori, or Ye Ye Wari, probably in the second half of the 17th century. It is significant that each of these women rulers led the Ilesa kingdom successfully during times of intense military challenges. A woman Yui, Ye Ye Lorou, so named because she lived at Ororo just outside the palace also led the Adu kingdom through serious internal strife, probably in the 17th century. Every kingdom also had a high female chieftaincy, the holder of which was the most senior woman in the realm and a member of the high councils of chiefs. And usually, there were special chieftaincies and priesthoods for women who performed certain functions, such as in the marketplace and in certain palace rituals. Finally, in every kingdom, one of the wives of the king was a titled wife, a position that entitled her in some kingdoms to sit by the king in some public appearances and to speak in some councils of chiefs. It is most probably this titled wife that we see in some bronze figures of early Unis, figures made in Ife between the 12th century and the 15th. Typically, these bronze figures show the uni and a female companion standing side by side, each wearing a crown, arms locked, with the king's left leg locked over his companion's right leg. These figures seem to symbolize the statement that the king's titled wife was very important in the affairs of state. The Agboni as an institution went out from Ife with the founders of the earliest kingdoms, and became a very important factor in the typical Yoruba monarchical system in all kingdoms, exercising very powerful influence on the affairs of state, even until the 20th century. One recent study has suggested that the Ogboni's influence was muted for some time before the 19th century in the Oyoila kingdom of the Ilafin, a suggestion contradicted by some other studies. The available evidence is, on the whole, 
fuzzy concerning the place of the Ogboni and Old Oyo in the imperial era. But the evidence is unambiguous that after the Ilafans kingdom relocated its royal base southwards in the fourth quarter of the 19th century, the Ogboni was very influential in its affairs. Most of what has been written in the above paragraphs concerns the commanding heights of the governmental system of the Yoruba kingdoms. However, it is important to note that, on the whole, governance involved the broad spectrum of the community that is, that the system was considerably open and participatory. Thus, for instance, the political system featured, from the lowest to the highest levels, important, established, meetings. The primary level, or base, of the system, was the lineage in its compound. The lineage had many important corporate assets, interests and functions, for which general and special lineage meetings were held. There were all member meetings to take decisions on the care, maintenance, improvement, or expansion of the lineage's sprawling compound, the management of issues arising from members' use of parts of the lineage farmland and the conditional admission of non-members thereto, the sharing of certain common goods, like the tolls paid by non-members for permission to use the lineage's farmland, arrangements for weddings and funerals of members, and for participation in such events and other closely related lineages, arrangements for festivals and rituals, selection of the chief, if a chieftaincy title was domiciled in the lineage, reception and consideration of decisions and directives from higher levels of government. And then there were special leaders' meetings for the settlement of disputes and quarrels, for trying cases of indiscipline and assigning punishment, for consultation of the oracles and carrying out of sacrifices for the welfare of the lineage, and for the disposal of a deceased member's belongings. Beyond the lineage compound, the age great associations, of which all citizens were members, had appointed days for their all member meetings for the purpose of carrying out their duties to the community, and for mobilizing support for members during important events in their lives, and also for holding association feasts and festivals. Each chief of a street had appointed days for meetings with lineage heads in his street, and also held occasional meetings of all the people of his street, mostly for the purpose of disseminating the decisions and directives of the king's government, and for other matters affecting the street. For these types of purposes too, each quarter chief had appointed days of meetings with the street chiefs, and with the lineage heads, in his quarter. Over most important matters, it was established practice that the palace government consulted directly with leaders of lineages and age grade associations, as well as with leaders of professional and trade associations like the Hunters Association, Market Commodity Associations, the Diviners Association, the Herbalists Association, the priestly leaders of all cults, etc. Very important also was the fact that, as would be remembered, Every citizen was in a position to influence the selection of a prince as king, through contact with the council of kingmakers or its members. In every kingdom, there were days traditionally designated as days of town meetings, when citizens who cared to come would solemnly gather at the palace, always early in the morning, with the high chiefs, with the king and usually concealed attendants, hear their chiefs over important current issues, ask questions and express opinions. In every kingdom also, there were one or two special festival days in the year on which people paraded peacefully in crowds through the streets and openly voiced criticisms of their chiefs and king, and satirized them, usually in impromptu and crudely composed songs without any intervention from the authorities and without any repercussions whatsoever. Also, in every Yoruba community, certain classes of persons, like musicians, singers, humorists, igungun masquerades, and certain categories of priests, enjoyed a near-sacred freedom to voice their feelings or thoughts, whether serious or humorous, about kings, chiefs, prominent citizens, and everyone else. On the whole, therefore, the typical system of government of a Yoruba kingdom had a considerably democratic character, and the Yoruba people in general were strongly established in the tradition of participation in the making of decisions that affected their lives in the community. At every level, even on the occasions when ordinary citizens gathered for meetings with the chiefs in the palace, the system enshrined freedom of speech, in fact, at certain levels, such as in the lineage, it was regarded as a sacred duty of the leader to ensure that every component section of the lineage and every individual had a say before a decision was concluded because every member was regarded as a chip of the ancestors. As for the women of the lineage, called Abiranila women married into the compound, no compound would take an important decision without involving and hearing its women. In fact, in certain matters, like weddings and some aspects of some festivals, leadership in the compound sometimes belonged more to the women than to the men. Lineages took meticulous care to involve their children in everything, and children's celebrations were common in lineages. For their part, the age grades operated in a tradition of very conscious respect for the opinions of members. 
In the affairs of age grade associations, it was not uncommon for a well-attended meeting to decide to suspend decision on an issue if it was felt that absent members needed to be given a chance to voice their opinion. And if things were shared in a meeting, the association would go to great lengths to see that absent members received their shares, no matter how small the shares were. Participation in an age grade's community tasks was compulsory for all members, and members who were absent for reasons other than sickness had to make some payment to their association. The effect of all this on the individual was that he or she was usually confident to speak, and could be quite eloquent, as a member of the community, and was used to being respected by those who held positions of authority over him or her in the community. This, then, is the basic outline of the system of government under which Yoruba people lived in their many kingdoms until Europeans came and imposed foreign rule on Yoruba land. To complete the description, a number of facts need to be briefly noted. Although each kingdom gave its own unique institutional and functional interpretations to various details of the system, the governments of the kingdoms were, in essence, remarkably similar. Chieftaincy titles, and the functions assigned to titles, might vary somewhat from kingdom to kingdom, but a Yoruba person traveling through, or relocating to, another part of the country knew broadly what to expect in terms of governance, the laws, and the functionaries of state. This served to a great extent to facilitate contacts, internal migrations and relocations, and broad intermixture and integration of Yoruba people throughout the Yoruba homeland. The system was not without significant weaknesses, however. One of the most important weaknesses inhered in the system of selection of kings from members of the royal family. In spite of the Olympian solidity and responsibility presumed of the Council of Kingmakers, selection occasionally generated an open contest and dispute, with all that this implied. The laws made it a high crime to protest after the selection had been made, and that sometimes meant criminal trials and stiff punishments including executions. But even though an aggrieved prince might not be able to protest, with his supporters, in the streets, he could cause other painful troubles for the state, he was free to emigrate, taking family, friends and sympathizers with him usually a very sad event in the life of a royal town. The fear of provoking this painful outcome always weighed heavily with the Council of Kingmakers and made its members usually meticulously cautious and responsible, but sometimes, its very best performance proved insufficient to prevent this trouble. One cumulative consequence of all this was that interregnums or short-term disruptions were not unknown in the system. Similar problems also attended the selection of chiefs at lower levels of the system. Given the large number of chiefly positions in each kingdom, chieftaincy contests and disputes tended to be a rather frequent feature of the life of every city. Another source of weakness was the provision for the removal of kings. Ordinarily, this provision was very infrequently invoked and, whenever invoked, usually passed quite quietly. But it was not unknown for kings who were urged to go to sleep, or who saw it coming, to slip out of the palace and flee into exile, and whenever that happened, it usually shut down the high functions of the monarchy because then the royal funeral rites could not be performed, a new king could not be enthroned, and vacant chieftaincy titles could not be filled. In such a tight predicament, the high chiefs commonly fabricated legends, such as that the king turned into a great animal and went into the wild, or that he simply entered into the earth, in order to calm the populace, and in order to manipulate the priests into agreeing to undertake alternative rituals. But the problem would usually not end with the installation of another king. The authorities of the kingdom would for long be engaged in efforts to ensure that the news of their self-exiled king would not seep back home. It could be a very destabilizing circumstance. And, therefore, it was quite common for self-exiled kings to be quietly invited back to their thrones. Finally, the limited monarchy of the Yoruba presupposed a king who was well adjusted to, and respected, the systemic limitations placed on royal power, and the whole system was managed in ways that were designed to ensure this. For instance, it was for this reason that the Council of Kingmakers took care, ideally, not to select as king a prince who was powerful, rich or influential in his own right for fear that their king might claim later that he had obtained the throne on his own strength. Consequently, the history of every kingdom is replete with stories of rich or influential princes who were passed over for their humbler brothers or cousins. Many details in the installation rituals, and the intensive briefing of the new king in a special compound for some months before being taken to the palace, were designed to communicate and inculcate the true nature of the kingship. So too are many seasonal and annual rituals, including the ritualized recounting of the kingdom's history during certain festivals. In spite of all this sophisticated structuring, however, and in spite of all the grandeur attending to kings, it sometimes happened that a kingdom would find itself with a king who exhibited inappropriate ambition or troublesome independence a king who thereby brought stress upon the whole system by threatening the balances crucial to its stability. Also, though much more rarely, 
Yoruba traditions tell of chiefs below the level of king who became ambitious and aggressive, and sought to readjust the systemic balances in favor of their particular chieftaincies thus setting off unhealthy rivalry or conflicts among chiefly lineages. Whenever any of these situations developed, the monarchical system experienced troubles and even instability. It says much for the strength and resilience of the system, however, that, in spite of these weaknesses, it survived in considerably good health for many centuries. Of course, modifications had to be adopted in each kingdom from time to time along the way, but the intrinsic character of the system was never seriously altered. Religion and the State As had been the case in the small ancient settlements before Odujua's time, the governance of every Yoruba kingdom was deeply rooted in religion. The king was, as earlier pointed out, a companion of the gods. Every act, function or affair of state was anchored on the gods of the nation. The annual calendar of every kingdom was marked with many days of public festivals, holidays and feasts for the gods, some such festivals occasioning mammoth public celebrations usually centered on the palace. Shrines, large or small, stood at significant locations in every town or village at town gates, at many locations in the palace, at the marketplace, and in every quarter. Besides such public shrines, every lineage compound had a small shrine of its own at which the leader and elders of the lineage performed rituals and offered sacrifices to the gods and the ancestors for the welfare of the lineage. The Yoruba king was a sacred king. His selection, installation and daily life as king were all shrouded in religious mystery, rituals, observances and sacrifices. The installation of a newly selected king involved a round of rituals at many shrines, located not only in the royal city but also in some towns and villages in his kingdom, as well as initiation into various mysteries. When the process was completed, the king emerged from it a sacred being. Therefore, for any citizen to touch the person of a king, not to talk of striking him, was ultimate sacrilege. Typically, there were, in the year, only a very few days in which some sacrifices were not offered in the palace to one or more of the hundreds of gods worshipped by the Yoruba people. The king was the highest priest of the kingdom, and all the high priests of all the cults were, in principle, his assistants. Unlike all other persons, he was supposed to be a priest in the worship and rituals of all gods in his realm. The cult of Ogun, the god of all working men, of iron, and of war, was the special royal cult to which the king paid more attention than he did to other cults. In the Oyoila kingdom, however, the cult of Sango, the god of thunder and lightning, early developed as another, and somewhat higher, royal cult. For the welfare of his kingdom, the king bore the important duty of regularly seeking counsel from Ifa, the god of divination and of offering prescribed sacrifices to the other gods. The king's highly ritualized burial and the location of his grave were perhaps the most closely guarded secrets of every kingdom. The Yoruba were very sophisticated in the use of symbols and icons to express deep and powerful statements, and everything around the king conveyed profound messages. Thus, every significant detail of the palace building the carvings of the wooden pillars and doors, the murals on the walls, etc. all were iconographic statements relating to aspects of the origins of the kingdom the Odidua source of its royal dynasty, the all-pervading oversight and care of the gods, the perpetual presence of the kings who had ruled in the palace, and the visible and invisible powers or authority of the king. The conical beaded crown, said to originate in Odidua's time, and therefore known as the Great Crown or the Crown of Odidua, was loaded with great iconographic meanings. The dominant, front-placed, one among the faces depicted on the beaded patterns on the crown is usually said to represent Odidua's face. The other faces, commonly sixteen in number, represented the sacred assembly of the kings who had reigned on the particular throne. The crown therefore was no ordinary ceremonial head covering, but the object holding in itself the unification of the life forces, oso or power, of the progenitor of the Yoruba nation, and the royal ancestors of the reigning king. When, therefore, the crown was put on the king's head, his life force was added to the powerful combination of life forces inherent in the crown thus making it a sacred object with unimaginable visible and invisible powers the visible totemic image of the invisible essence, power and authority of the kingdom. For this reason, the Yoruba regarded the king's crown as an orisa or deity. The conical crown usually had a beaded figure of a bird on its top, and sometimes other smaller birds, usually numbering from 4 to 16, attached to the sides near the top. Pemberton and Afalayan, writing specifically about the crown of the Orangun Avila, wrote as follows. Henry and Margaret Rule have shown in their studies of bird imagery in Yoruba iconography that birds are associated with the power, of women or our mothers, it is their hidden, procreative power, a power that can give birth but can also be used to deny others their creative power. It is woman's power upon which the continuity of a husband's patrilineage depends. 
and, without the mothers, a king, could not rule. Furthermore, the large bird at the peak of the crown is attached to a peg the other end of which is bound to a packet of powerful ingredients, placed in the top of the crown, the packet touches the top of the Aba head, which is thought to contain, his, life force, it makes the Oba powerful over all kinds of spirits, with the crown on his head, the Oba embodied the supernatural entities and forces that sustained the existence of his kingdom and all life and order in it. The king's enhanced osa, power and authority, was seen as ensuring human increase in his kingdom, the health of his people, good rains and healthy crops, peace and order, etc. Pemberton and Alpha Lionad. Such a power must not be looked upon or approached without fear and trepidation, chiefs and townspeople must remove their shoes, men prostrate and women kneel before him, addressing the Oba without looking directly upon his face. Servants must roll on the ground, as gestures of absolute subjection. If the Oba left the palace, only on festival or ritual processions, he was surrounded by his entourage, made up of his chiefs and priests and servants, and was barely visible to his other subjects. Nobody must walk to meet him in his entourage, all must stand by the roadside, and those who wished to join his entourage could only do so after he had passed them by. The king must not witness the birth of a child, and he must not see a baby who had not yet had its birth hair shave the hair on the head of a newborn baby came from the spirit realm, and this property of the spirit realm must not encounter the spirit of the king. Also, the Oba must not see or touch a dead body or see a grave dug for burial, a corpse was a threat to the king's life-giving power. The King's Palace Usually the first public facility constructed in every royal city was the palace. For this, an effort was usually made to find a distinctive location, normally a low hill around which the new city could evolve. Imade built the first Owo Palace on the low hill known as Oke Segbo, a Segbo Hill, where the Owo City Hall now stands. His successors moved it to a better location on Okikasi, Ikusi Hill, where it now stands. Awamaro built the Adu, Akiti, palace on the gently rising hill known as Okadodo, where it served as the hub linking the group of quarters of the old settlers, at Odo Adu, and those of the immigrants, at Okui, and where it stands today. The Ijebu Kingdom of Ofen built the Akarigbo's palace on Oko Hill, a beautiful location overlooking most of the royal town. In the hilltop city of Efon in Akiti, the Alay's palace was built on a distinct little peak. In every kingdom, the main palace buildings were surrounded by many acres of ground, most of which was left under virgin forest. A wall, known as Gabagid, was then built to surround the palace and its grounds, with access through one large gate. It was a measure of a king's success that he added to, or improved upon, the palace buildings, especially its gate structures. As a result, the growth of the palace constitutes an important theme in the traditionally preserved history of every Yoruba kingdom. The biggest and most powerful kingdoms had the most impressive palaces. In the forest country of Yoruba land by the 18th century, the palaces of Ijebu Ode, Owo, Ilesa, Odondo, Akure and Adu, in Akiti, seem to have been the most impressive the Owo palace being, according to most Yoruba traditions, the largest, followed by the Ilesa palace, and then the Ijebu Ode, Odondo, Adu, Akiti, and Akure palaces. Like its city walls, Iluyar's palace was famous for its grandeur, before the city was abandoned. Oh, Uipol most certainly had one of the most impressive palaces also, but it was destroyed in the early 19th century. Owo Palace traditions identify the two Owo kings who contributed most to the greatness of the Owo Palace. The first was Ogeya, who probably reigned in the 15th century, and the second was Osogboy, whose reign has been dated to the early 17th century. Ogea moved the palace from its first Hoke Segbo location to Ikasi Hill where he laid out large palace buildings. And Osag Boy, reputed in Owo traditions as the greatest of the Owo kings, added grand extensions and beautifications and enclosed so much land within the palace wall that the Owo palace came to earn the reputation of the largest palace in all of Yoruba land. Palace walls, Gabagid, were different from city walls, they were, like house walls, built of molded mud plaster but made much thicker and higher than any house wall. A visitor to Ilesa in the mid-19th century wrote, Surrounding the ruler's palace was a great wall, some 18 to 20 feet high and 5 to 6 feet thick. In every kingdom, therefore, the palace buildings tended to grow into a sprawling establishment with many, and ever-increasing, halls and courtyards. In most palaces, the oldest buildings became, in a few centuries, no more than a museum or curiosity visited only on certain festivals and rituals by persons in the innermost circles of government. Somewhere in some deep recesses of the palace grounds, the bodies of deceased kings were buried. However, the popular myth, propagated by the highest chiefs and priests, 
was that kings never died but turned to rocks or other objects or simply entered into the earth. Partly for this reason, partly to preserve the awe attaching to the king, cultivation of any part of the palace grounds was strictly forbidden in every kingdom forbidden even to the king himself. In many kingdoms, the palace forest was known as Igboronkoja, the forest through which even ants may not crawl, or some other such fearsome name. The Yoruba palace started in every kingdom, no doubt, as the compound where the king and his family lived and where central government business was done. However, centuries of myth-making around the king turned it into a place of mystery where only the sacred person of the king resided, where his chiefs went to transact government business with him. In most kingdoms, the mundane features of human life were ultimately exiled from the palace like women giving birth, babies crying, persons dying or being buried, voices raised in anger or quarrel or excitement, people leaving for or arriving from farms, marketplaces or other pursuits. The practice developed, therefore, that the compounds of the highest chiefs housed some members of the king's family and the chiefs acted as foster parents to young children of the kings. Meanwhile, the palace grew apace in the popular mind as a place of mystery a place of strange happenings and strange encounters, a special type of sacred shrine. City Walls While working on building their palace, the founders of each kingdom usually also embarked on building their city wall. The experience too was more or less the same everywhere. No sooner was the first wall completed than another one longer in circumference, or a loop to enclose more land space, was commenced made necessary, presumably, by unexpected influx of people from the neighboring forests. The typical Yoruba city wall, called Yarorodi, was a combination of trench and earthworks. The deeper and wider the trench, the higher were the earthworks. Against the weapons employed in warfare in their times, the Yoruba city walls provided a reasonably formidable defense. The invader must first climb to the top of the outside earthworks, then drop to the bottom of the trench, and then attempt to climb up the perpendicular wall of the trench, with the inner earthworks still waiting for him to scale on the inner top of the trench. The trenches were usually some 15 feet deep, the better ones being considerably deeper, and, in most cities, much more than 20 feet wide at the top, with the earthworks heaped on both sides, higher on the inside than on the outside. Nature usually helped to increase the efficacy of these walls. Good rainy seasons left considerable depths of water at the bottom of most trenches, making a descent into them very dangerous. A stretch of thick vegetation was usually planted, or allowed to grow, on the outside of the wall. To make an approach to the outside earthworks difficult. Gates, called bode, punctuated the wall system, each gate secured with a guard post under the command of a palace official with the title of on abode, some of whose staff also collected the customs and tolls on merchandise. Some of the highest chiefs acted as superintendents over particular gates. Most walls enclosed considerable acreages of farmland with their cities, as a sort of reserve for times of prolonged emergencies. The first written reference to any Yoruba city wall is found in an early 16th century note by a Portuguese trader on the West African coast, Duarte Pacheco Pereira, who wrote, 12 or 13 leagues upstream from Lagos there is a large town called Jibu, surrounded by a very large ditch. The Ijebuod wall, called the Irido Sungbo, parts of which still survive, has, according to Robert Smith, a circuit of some 80 miles and appears to enclose an area of some 400 square miles around the town of Ijebuod. It is still in places 20 feet high, with an outer ditch of 20 to 25 feet in depth. Smith's description is of the Arido as it existed in the late 20th century, over five or six hundred years after its construction, of which the last 100 years have seen much house building and other construction works that have reduced much of the wall's earthworks and trench. In its pristine condition, say by the end of the 18th century, it must have been a truly gigantic structure, with trenches reaching depths of 30 feet and parts and earthworks as high as 20 feet or more. In 1855, the CMS missionary in Ibadan, David Hinderer, visited Ijebuod and described the trench of the Arido as a wonderfully deep trench. Besides the Oyoila walls, which will be described in another chapter, the greatest city walls in the country seem to have belonged to Ijebuod, Oo, Ilesa and Ouipol. The total destruction of Ouipol in 1822 makes a description of that city and its walls impossible, but Yoruba traditions speak of that city and its defenses as truly magnificent. According to Uu traditions, Owo embarked, under Osogboy in the early 17th century, on the construction of very mighty city walls. The end product was widely regarded as one of the greatest in Yoruba land. Of the Elisa city walls, we have some mid-19th century descriptions by a literate visitor William H. Clark, who traveled extensively in Yoruba land in 18,578 and spent three days in Elisa. His assessment was that Elisa surpassed Iloran in size, 
population, and in the strength of its defenses. Abilas's defenses he wrote, four or five miles from the town, my attention was drawn to three separate ditches ten feet wide, cut through the woods and running, how far I could not tell. The missionary David Hinderer visited Elisa about the same time and described it as one of the larger towns of the country, in extent perhaps next to Ibadan. The walls are at least 15 feet high and no less than 6 feet thick, with a trench around it of about 20 feet in depth, whereas inside there are high trees close to it all at a distance of about 10 yards one from the other, so that a scaffolding can be erected between their branches to defend the walls from it. Hundreds of human skulls are tempered into these walls, at the north gate I counted upwards of a hundred, all of which are of war captives. Adu, Ahidi, had a fortunate location in a high bowl formed by a nearly semicircular range of hills comprising the Oloda Rock and two or three smaller hills. Streams from these hills flowed through the town in a general southern direction, at the southernmost end of the town, their confluence formed a wide marshy area before a single stream, called the Agilosun, drained away into the southern forests. The hills and the marshy area, where there were some small lakes, provided protection around much of Adu. It was only in the gaps that Adu people needed to construct city walls, but these wall segments had some of the deepest trenches and highest earthworks in the country. Relentlessly quarried for laterite from modern buildings since the early 20th century, some of the earthworks and their ditches still survive here and there. Most other royal towns of Akiti had similarly fortunate locations owing to the hilly nature of the Akiti country. Ijero, Ikir, Arandito perched partly on the slopes of hills, and Efen and Amisi Igbodo, now Okamesi, on top of steep-sided hills. The Alasanda hill and rock provided a near-perfect defense for much of the city of Akir. The hills, says an Akiti proverb, make the Alai, king of Efen, defy all invasions. Even these, as well as most other Akiti towns, had some wall systems. In the Akiti, Akoko, Igbamana and other hilly areas of Yoruba land, some towns arranged large rocks to form balustrades and ramparts serving as walls. The King's Marketplace the creation of a king's marketplace or Oyaoba was one of the most important developments in every new royal city. Trade was very important to the Yoruba people, and the kings took seriously the provision of facilities for its proper running. As soon as the building of the palace commenced, therefore, an area in its foreground, a short distance beyond the palace gate, was cleared and measured out for the king's marketplace. A marketplace close to the palace, usually located just outside its front walls, became an unalterable attribute of the Yoruba royal city or town. The king himself was the grand patron of the marketplace, although one of the chiefs would traditionally stand in for him as master in charge. Palace messengers laid out the marketplace to the satisfaction of the traders themselves, ensuring that vendors of each particular article of merchandise had one area, called ISO, allocated to them. While the traders constructed their sheds and the facilities for spreading out their wares, palace messengers planted shade trees, needed to prevent excessive heat in the marketplace and also to provide some decoration. When the marketplace became functional, senior palace messengers did patrol duties in it as peace officers and also collected tolls authorized by the king's government. The sellers of each article usually formed a market commodity association of which the king was usually patron, even though each association would also appoint other citizens as additional patrons. In short, then, the influence of the king pervaded the marketplace. In fact, the creation of the king's marketplace was a major item in his establishment of sovereignty over his new kingdom. The king's marketplace was a special and symbolic banner of royal sovereignty, therefore, whenever it was time for the authorities to announce the death of a king, they would order the symbolic act of having the tops of the shade trees of the king's marketplace trimmed. In many of the royal cities, the king's marketplaces grew into sprawling establishments occupying tens or even hundreds of acres. Besides Oyoila, the largest king's market in the country by about the 17th century was at Ijebuod, followed probably by Owo and Ilesa, Ouipol, Akuri, Adu, Ahidi, and Ila, the greatest centers of trade in southern and eastern Yoruba land by the 17th century. Every one of the king's marketplaces became a link in the great chain of long-distance trade that interconnected all of Yoruba land. Subordinate Towns and Villages Many kingdoms never expanded their sovereignty beyond the royal city and its farmland. All of the Akoko and Ikale kingdoms, some of the Akiti, Ijesa and the Igbato kingdoms, and most of the far western Yoruba kingdoms stagnated in their royal cities. Of the rest, some acquired only a few towns and villages, while others acquired quite considerable territory with many towns and villages in it. The Akiti kingdoms were generally small territorially, the three largest ones being Adu, Akuri, and Moba, with Otan as capital. During the first two or three centuries of the history of the Adu kingdom, 
it gradually expanded the territory under its control until it came to rule over 20 subordinate towns in a kingdom stretching from northwest to southeast for some 60 miles, the largest kingdom in Akiti. The Owo kingdom was somewhat larger than that, consisting of forest territory more than 70 miles in length from north to south with more than 20 towns. The Ilesa kingdom quickly became the largest Ijesa kingdom, while the Olaus kingdom dwarfed the other kingdoms of the Ou. The Osemo of Ondo ruled over a large forest kingdom extending all the way from the Oni River in the north to boundaries with the Ikaule and Ilahe in the coastal lagoon country, and from the Owena River in the east to indefinite forest boundaries with the Ijebu in the west, certainly one of the largest kingdoms in Yoruba land. Among the Igba, the Gabagura are said to have had some 144 small towns located at short distances from one another, of which 72 came to owe allegiance to the Aguro of Ito and 72 to the Onagun of Alugun. Each of the other Igba kingdoms Kesi ruled by the Ojoko, Ake under the Ilig, and Oko under the Oshil or Aliko also came to rule over tens of small towns. By about the 18th century, the Ijebu Od kingdom was perhaps the largest forest kingdom of the Yoruba people. To the south, this kingdom shared a boundary with the Awari of the Lagos kingdom on the coast, to the east it shared a boundary with the Ondo, to the northeast with the Ou and Dife, and to the west with the Igba and the small kingdoms of the Ijebu Ramo province. These territorial expansions were accomplished in diverse ways during the long period starting from the founding of the first kingdoms in about the 11th century to the 18th century. As earlier pointed out, in most kingdoms, when the royal city was being established people came out to it from the neighboring forests. The traditions of many kingdoms show that these immigrants to the city usually continued to preserve their farming and land use interests in their former villages, ultimately producing the situation whereby the city regarded those villages as subject to itself. Often. Farming, fishing or trading activities by city people resulted in the emergence of subordinate villages and towns in the neighboring forests. Quite often also, villages, unassimilated old settlements or mini-states, and independently emerging settlements, sought protection of the nearby city. Most such protected settlements became fully absorbed as subjects of the city government. In some cases, however, such towns or villages acquired a status of semi-independence, or even maintained their independence, within the kingdom, each thus existing as a state within the state. In Odondo, for instance, the Olaja of Idoko, in return for special religious services done for the Osamawe, was allowed to keep his own hierarchy of chiefs very much like the Osemas, even after Idoko had become absorbed into the kingdom of Odondo. The relationships of Igbar Oak to the Akure kingdom, and Ilawi and Igbar Odo to the Adu kingdom, seem to have belonged to this type. Finally, Every ultimately large kingdom contained towns and villages that were conquered by the armed forces of the royal city. It would seem, as Adeo Bayemi has suggested, that by about 1600, absorption, destruction and conquest of independent mini-states and settlements by centralized kingdoms had been completed in most parts of Yoruba land. By then, in effect, centralized kingdoms shared boundaries with one another all over Yoruba land. In many cases, kingdoms responded to the situation by setting up border posts as a means of protecting and stabilizing their boundaries. For instance, when the Oyoila kingdom and the Ilesa kingdom came to share a border, Oyoila established Heat, and Ilesa established Hosogbo, as border posts. Subordinate towns and villages were known as Uriko that is, settlements of the farmlands. Usually, a subordinate town or village retained the line of rulers it had had before coming under the authority of the city. In some cases, however the city authorities placed their own nominee over an Oriko town or village, usually in instances where some vital interest, like an important road junction, required special control. Every substantial Oriko settlement was organized like its city, under the headship of a local ruler called the Baal, and cadres of chiefs. The Baal, followed by his chiefs, owed allegiance to the king in the city. Usually, a high chief in the city government was appointed to act as liaison between the city government and the government of a particular Oriko town or village. This usually meant that the high chief transmitted messages between the king's government and the Oriko government, received in his compound the bail and his chiefs on their official visits to the city, and led them to the palace if they had business to do in the palace. The king's government owed the Oriko towns and villages the duty of defending them, of coming to their aid in emergencies, and of intervening to sort out their most difficult disputes. The king's palace also served as the final court of appeal in any cases arising in an Oriko town or village. On their part, Oriko towns and villages owed the king the duty of contributing men and materials to his army in time of war, as well as to repairs, expansions or improvements of the palace or the city wall. Routine levies and impositions on subordinate communities were not usually part of the Yoruba system, 
instead there was a general culture of support and gifts to the king on important festivals and jubilees. One Band of Brothers Most Yoruba traditions concerning their kingdoms deal with the relationships of these kingdoms, first with their source, the Ilaife kingdom, and then with one another. The most widespread of the traditions have it that the character of those relationships was clearly established at Ilaife before the first emigrant princes went out from there to found kingdoms. According to these traditions, earlier referred to, the Ida Ijero meeting laid down, on oath, two important undertakings the first, that all kingdoms established outside Ife would forever honor Ife, the Ariran or Springhead, the second, that all Yoruba kings would forever relate to one another as brothers. Traditions of many Yoruba kingdoms contain popular accounts of periodic rituals involving the sending of official envoys to the palace, or some shrine, in Ila Ife. When kings consulted the Ifa oracle about the welfare of their kingdoms also, prescriptions and rituals and sacrifices issued by the oracle often included that certain objects be sent to or obtained from Ila Ife, or that certain rituals or sacrifices be done at some Ila Ife shrine. All this must be seen against the backdrop of a national culture in which reference to wife's name was a constant, unavoidable, factor in all worship, all rituals and all divination. Moreover, Yoruba and Benin traditions have it that whenever a Yoruba kingdom or the Benin kingdom enthroned a new king, envoys were sent to the palace of Ife to inform the Uni that a new son had arisen over their kingdom, and that the Uni would then send gifts back to the new king as a token of his pleasure. These traditions have some strong corroboration in a Portuguese document of the middle of the 16th century, which states as follows. Among the many things which the King Dom Joao learned from the ambassador of the King of Beni, and also Afonso de Averu, of what they had been told by the inhabitants of those regions, was that to the east of the King of Beni a twenty moons journey which according to their account and the slow pace at which they travel, would be about 250 of our leagues there lived the most powerful monarch of those parts whom they called Ogun. Among the pagan princes of the territories of Beni he was held in a great veneration, as are the supreme pontiffs with us. In accordance with a very ancient custom, the kings of Beni, on ascending the throne, sent ambassadors to him with rich gifts to inform him that by the decease of their predecessor they had succeeded to the kingdom of Beni, and to request him to confirm them in the same. As a sign of confirmation this Prince Ogun sent them a staff and headpiece, fashioned like a Spanish helmet, made all of shining brass, in place of a scepter and crown. He also sent a cross, of the same brass, and shaped like something religious and holy. Without these emblems the people would consider that they did not reign lawfully, nor could they call themselves true kings. All the time this ambassador was at the court of the Ogun, he never saw him, but only some silk curtains behind which he was placed, like some sacred object. When the ambassador was taking his leave, he was shown a foot from within the curtains as a sign that the Ogun was behind them and granted the request he had made, this they reverenced as though it were something holy. While the above text seems to confirm quite clearly, and in detail, the traditions that are common in the Yoruba Edo region, it is important to note that some questions have been raised about it. Writing in the 1960s, AFC writer expressed the opinion that the Ogun of this text could not have referred to the Uni of Ife, since the Uni lived northwest of Benin while the text said that the Ogun lived east of Benin. Writer then suggested that the Ogun should be sought not in Ife but in the region close to the Niger Benue confluence or somewhere else east of Benin. However, other scholars have cast serious doubts on writers' conclusions. The art historian, Frank Willett, has shown how very close were the art traditions, especially the brass-slash-bronze sculptural traditions, of Ife and Benin, a fact which proves considerable closeness in the history of the two societies. And then there is the existence of very many other traditions linking Ife and Benin including the Ornmian traditions, and the existence of a quarter, and shrine, in Ila Ife with the name of Ornobadu, roughly. Tomb of the Kings of Benin, where, according to Ife traditions, the heads, or perhaps effigies or totems, of deceased Benin kings used to be interred. It has also been suggested that East in the text was some sort of mistake, or that it came from foreigners' misunderstanding of the well-known, common, reference to Ife as the place from where the sun rises, or that it may have arisen from the fact that the most popular routes from Benin to Ife probably initially pointed northeast, to avoid the thick forest and big rivers west of Benin before bending around in the Okoko Edo hills to descend to Ida'aani and Owo. Whatever may be the correct explanation, there seems now to be no doubt that the Ogun of the Portuguese text was the Uni of Ife. Robert Smith concludes that the manner in which the Uni and Ife are generally regarded in the Yoruba Edo region leaves hardly any doubt that the Ogun of the Portuguese text was the Uni of Ife. Finally, it ought to be added that attempts to find the Ogun in the area of the niger benue confluence or anywhere east of Benin, as suggested by Ryder, have been totally futile. Newly installed Yoruba kings, as well as the kings of Benin, 
then, sent to inform the Uni of their ascension to the throne, and received totemic gifts from him to convey his confirmation or pleasure. It seems quite certain also that Yoruba kingdoms occasionally sought help from Ife towards the resolution of some of their political disputes, especially disputes requiring clarification of some point of history. Moreover, as would be remembered, important symbols of royalty and legitimacy beads, beaded crown, beaded scepter, opaakun, beaded ceremonial fan and walking stick, opailik, and beaded horsetail fly whisks were obtained only from Ife for some centuries, often through channels that originated from, or passed through the Ila Ife Palace. Some connection with the Ife dynasty was the universal proof of legitimacy. In the course of the 15th century, however, Ife's primacy over Yoruba land waned rapidly over a short time, it would seem. The beginning of the decline appears to have been marked by a long war or a series of wars to which Ife traditions give much prominence. According to the traditions, Ife had to go to war in the reign of the female Uni, Luwogabagada, probably in the first half of the 15th century. Luo is listed as the 20th Uni in some Ife king's lists. Soon after she came to the throne, Ife had to embark on a long war known to Ife history as the Aru War. The war continued into the reign of Gizi, probably her immediate successor. The Ara in the war is not clearly identified but there seems to be no doubt that it was the Ara kingdom in Akiti. So important was this war that Luo ordered all able-bodied young men to enlist in the army, arresting and even executing some who would not as a result of which she became known in history as the Uni who nearly depopulated Ila Ife. The emergency also called for improvements by Gizi to the wall defenses of Ila Ife, including the planting of a thick belt of trees between the city and the walls. Concerning the cause of the war that occasioned all this tough mobilization, the traditions offer little clear information. From the way in which the account of the war is usually rendered, it seems quite clear that this was a war fought at Ara rather than a war against Ara a war in which a large Ife army was camped at Ara to confront a serious enemy. The enemy is not clearly identified, but other traditions relating to the Akiti and Ijesa countries in about the 15th century point to clear probabilities. Changes in the configuration of trade routes had turned the Akiti and Ijesa region into a very important area of trade by the 15th century. Trade routes from the Noop country on the Niger, southwards to Benin on the coast, increased the commercial importance of the Akiti kingdoms in between, and threatened to reduce the commercial importance of Ife to the people of the Akiti area. The first Benin invasion of the Akiti country occurred in the early 15th century, as also did Noop invasions of the Akiti and Ijesa areas through the Igbomina country. It would seem that, in defense of its commercial and security interests, the Ife kingdom sent a large army to Ara in order to curtail the military activities especially of the Noop in the Akiti country and that the Ife army needed to encamp at Ara for a long time for the purpose. Back home in Ife, steps were taken to strengthen Ilife's defenses in case the Noop, whose western wings were active in the Ijesa area, about which more will be said later, should decide to veer further west and attack Ila Ife. In short then, by the 15th century, Ife's control of almost all the trade of Yoruba land was beginning to unravel, while Noop incursions into Ijesa threatened the kingdom. All this compelled Ife to invest in large, prolonged, military ventures, a step which it had never had to take in all the centuries since the fight against Igbo Igbo in the 11th century. The military ventures appear to have been successful in the short run. Benin avoided a direct clash with Ife by shifting its operations largely eastwards where, to some extent in the Koko and on a large scale in Afanmai, called Kukuraku by the Noop, Benin forces came into heavy clashes with the Noop. The armies of Ilesa also repulsed the Noop in Ijesa. But these successes were not sufficient in the long run to avert a downturn in Ife's fortunes. The essence of the situation worked irresistibly against Ife. The rise of the many royal cities all over Yoruba land over the centuries had opened up the country, strengthened communication and commerce, and greatly boosted Ife's central commercial position and prosperity. But by the 15th century, the royal cities had become so many largely independent commercial centers, served by routes that pointed in all directions. Ife was ceasing to occupy a central position commercially. The Benin Kingdom from the southeast and the Noop from the northeast tried to channel the whole eastern arm of Yoruba trade to their own advantage, compelling Ife to plunge in in order to stop them. But the Benin initiative, at least, appears to have continued to prosper in spite of Ife's efforts. With the coming of European traders to the Benin ports from the closing years of the 15th century, its monopoly of the importation and distribution of European goods established Benin decisively as the controller of most of the trade of eastern Yoruba land. Not long after that, Oyoila, finally freed from the limitations imposed by its neighbors, the Bariba and the Noop, began to seize major shares in the trade of Yoruba land. To the northeast, 
Oyo Ila defeated the Nupa and seized most of their share of the trade of northeastern Yoruba land, and established a link with Benin in northern Ekiti, with Otun as a sort of commercial boundary. To the west, Oyo Ila took control of the trade through Owa with the Ijebu country, as well as the trade through the Igba and Igbado countries. Ife therefore declined, commercially and militarily. The traditions also indicate that Ife suffered in the 15th century from some long droughts and famines, which thus added to the general economic decline of the kingdom. It seems very probable in fact that the population of Ila Ife began to decline in the 15th or 16th century, and continued slowly to decline until the 19th century. The economic and political influence of Ife in Yoruba land thus declined from the 15th century on. By the late 18th century, the Ife kingdom seems to have become one of the smaller and weaker of the kingdoms of Yoruba land, and the city of Ila Ife had become considerably smaller than many other Yoruba cities. Nevertheless, the traditions are unambiguous that Ife in decline continued to be regarded by the generality of Yoruba people as the place of origins, the abode of the gods of the race, and the home source of all Yoruba kings. For the most part, kings continued to send envoys to Ila Ife to announce their ascension to the throne, and the envoys continued to return with totemic gifts. Kingdoms confronted by serious internal disputes or problems continued to send to Ila Ife for the clarification of knotty issues of history or for the performance of rituals and sacrifices prescribed by Ifa. To such envoys, Ila Ife was still a city of awesome mysteries, even though it had not the size, the population and the bubbling economic life of the cities from which they had come, and even though its king did not command the manifest power of the kings that they served. In the reign of the Yui Amanola, he who knows the road to wealth, in the early 18th century, the Du people proudly added to the Ariki of their king the lines that proclaimed him as, Atepa Alik Biuni Sor Ajua Oro Juni. He who walks with the beaded stick and counts the uni as friend, he who flaunts wealth that the uni does not have, but though economically, politically and militarily weak, the Ife kingdom was nevertheless master of its own territory, which no Yoruba king would dare to violate. Concerning the undertaking that all Yoruba kings should relate to one another as brothers, the subsequent record is mixed. Traditions describing periodic exchanges of messages and gifts between kings are found all over Yoruba land. In fact, in some cases, such practices have survived into modern times. For instance, it seems to have been a common practice that newly installed Ekiti kings used to send messengers to inform other Ekiti kings, and that gifts were usually exchanged on such occasions. On important state festivals also, Ekiti kings used to receive messages and gifts from other Ekiti kings. In the Adu kingdom, the great annual royal festival was the Idaroko, during which the Yui sat in state in Igbamot, the people's courtyard of the palace with large cheering crowds of his subjects in attendance, and his chiefs, followed by dancing members of their lineages, came to pay homage to him. For this festival, the Yui received royal messages, visitors and gifts from all over Akiti. So too did the Ilu Karavikir during the annual grand festival of the Alicenta. Most Akiti kingdoms, in fact, had such festivals, some of the rich kingdoms like Akol, Ara, Edo, Efen, Oi, Adu, Ikir and Ijero had more than one. Perhaps the most popular and best attended festival in Ekiti belonged to the Orinjales Kingdom of Eyes in southern Ekiti. This festival, called Alil, was a gorgeous celebration of beginnings during which, among other things, families with marriageable girls displayed them in the best of clothes and the girls sang to admiring crowds from all over Ekiti. Large numbers of visitors, royal messengers, and friends annually streamed to Eyes for this festival, some for the king and some for the families involved in the celebrations. Interactions of these types seem to have developed into special relationships between some Akiti kingdoms. The Yui of Adu, the Alekol of Akol, and the Ahero of Ijero, for instance, seem to have become a special group of brothers a group whose Thai Akiti folklore explained in a story. The story had it that a woman named Imod married and had sons in succession for the Alekol, the Yui and the Ahero, and that her three sons reigned as contemporaries on the thrones of the three kingdoms, thereby establishing a special bond among them. It is not known whether this is history or myth, but it seems fairly certain that for some time at least the Alekol, Yui and Ahero regarded themselves, and were regarded by other Akita kings, as having a special relationship that set them apart. Patterns of relationships similar to those among Akita kings existed in every subgroup region of the Yoruba country. In fact, the general Yoruba belief was that the kings in a Yoruba subgroup constituted a subfamily of the Yoruba family of kings. Some traditions also indicate that Yoruba kings in general believe that it was their duty individually and collectively to adjudicate in difficult disputes within or between kingdoms in the Yoruba family. Scattered accounts of such interventions exist in many traditions. 
According to one Oyo tradition recorded in Johnson's The History of the Yorubas, the Alafan Jayan of Oyo, probably in the 16th century, sent a senior Alari, palace envoy, to settle a dispute between Ou and Isayin. A dispute over the succession to the throne of the Ara kingdom was, according to some traditions, settled by officials from some, unidentified, kingdoms. As a result, civil war was averted, and the aggrieved candidate left peacefully and ultimately founded, with his many followers, the kingdom of Okaku in the Asin Valley. Akure traditions preserve a detailed account of a series of interactions of this type among some kingdoms. According to this account, about the middle of the 17th century, one Oa Avilesa, Atakun Mosa, fell out with his chiefs and people. Atakun Mosa slipped out of his palace and fled, before his chiefs could urge him to go to sleep. Fleeing south on the popular trade route, he stopped at Akuri and then continued to Benin, where he stayed as an exile for a few years in the palace of the Yoba of Benin, regarded as a member of the Odudua family of kings. He left Benin and retraced his steps to Akuri, and stayed for a few more years in the palace of the king of Akuri, whose title originally was Ajapata. At Akuri, he at last received his subjects' invitation to return to Ilesa and to the throne. The traditions imply that the Oba of Benin and the Ajapata of Akuri had been interceding for him with the Ilesa chiefs. Ataku and Mosa thereafter reigned very successfully, remembered by Ilesa as perhaps the greatest king in its history. His stay in Akuri resulted in a blood link between the Akuri and Ilesa dynasties. One of Ataku and Mosa's daughters married the Ajapata, and the son born of the marriage later became king of Akuri. When he was a baby, this son was given the name Alyafadeji by Atakun Mosa. With him the title of Akure kings changed from Ajapata to Deji. Likewise, evidence of very ancient territorial settlements between kingdoms abounds all over Yoruba land, settlements arrived at as resolutions of disputes. Ondo and Ikali traditions indicate the existence, in the forests between them, of such markers of agreed boundaries. The Akol and Adu kingdoms in Akiti have it in their traditions that they once established an agreed boundary marker between their two kingdoms at a place that they gave the name of Okiti Imod. Perhaps the best known of such ancient territorial markers was the one established at Apamu, probably in the 17th century, by the kingdoms of Ife, Oyo Ila and Ijebu Ode. Because of perennial conflicts involving traders from these kingdoms in the Apamu area, the three kings set up at Apamu a marker which they named Apimo, on oath that their kingdoms would never fight one another. Some traditions have it that the name Apimo, modified to Apamu over time, replaced the original name of this old Ife market town. The usual materials for such markers were cairns, heaps of stones, and the ritual tree called paragon that is believed to be able to survive all conditions, including forest fires. Brothers against brothers. Another face of the relationships among Yoruba kingdoms, however, featured conflicts and wars. In spite of the undoubted acceptance by all Yoruba kings of the brotherhood of all of them, differences in success, prosperity and power led, in the end, to territorial and other ambitions that produced conflicts. Ultimately, the general picture came to be that a successful and ambitious kingdom tended to aspire to dominance over kingdoms in its own subgroup that is, to unify the subgroup into just one kingdom. In a number of cases, indeed, very successful kingdoms aspire to even greater expansion than that, into Yoruba territories beyond their own subgroup territory. Owo and widespread Eastern Yoruba traditions have it that the Owo kingdom experienced great success from quite early in its history. Its location on some of the busiest trade routes in Yoruba land resulted in quick wealth and power. Growing threat of military conquest by its close southeastern neighbor, the powerful Edo kingdom of Benin, challenged this kingdom into becoming a considerable military power in its own right. By the 15th century, Owo had, according to Oladipo Alugbadian in his thesis, established an impressive forest kingdom with boundaries with Akiti to the north and northeast, Akoko to the north, and with Benin in the southeast. It soon absorbed the nearby kingdom of Ida'aani, an important town on the route to Benin. In the forests of the south of the Owo country, close to the boundary with Benin, a number of small kingdoms emerged Ifan, Sobi, Imaru, Ajagba, Ute, etc. Owo claimed sovereignty over these, in spite of resistance that was destined to go on for centuries. Having thus established its dominance over the whole of the Owo subgroup territory, the Owo kingdom then began strong bids to conquer the Akoko country and absorb its kingdoms. Repeatedly throughout the 17th century, Owo armies swept through the Akoko hills. These efforts reached a climax in the reign of the Olowo Ajaka, the most warlike ruler in Owo's history, about 176,080. According to Owo palace traditions, Ajaka, whose mother was from Akoko, invaded the Akoko country more than once and subdued many of its kingdoms. 
From Ajaka's time, Owo generally regarded the Okoko kingdoms as subordinate to itself. In Akiti, the two kingdoms of Adu and Akir, both founded in about the 14th century, began to clash early in their history. According to traditions recorded by the Adu historian, Rev. Anthony Oguntuyi, Adu claimed that the Elisan, whom the Yui had subdued to establish the Adu kingdom, had used to have some authority over the early settlements in Akir before the founding of the Akir kingdom. On the basis of that claim, the Adu kingdom, as it expanded, sought to establish a claim over parts of the territory of the Akir kingdom. The clashes that thus ensued went on intermittently for centuries, Adu fighting under the Yui and Akir fighting first under the Alukar and later under the Ogoga. Whenever either felt stronger, it launched an invasion off and on, all the way till the last years of the 19th century. Adu seems also to have had a feud with the Edo kingdom in the territory around Osi, as well as around Ifaki. The Adu Edo feud resulted in sapping the strength of Osi, which had started off as a kingdom with some prosperity. A somewhat similar feud existed for centuries between the two southern Akiti kingdoms of Ise and Amur. Only a few miles apart, these two kingdoms seemed to have been perpetually involved in trying to swallow each other up. Their hostilities continued to into the 19th century. The Igesa kingdom of Ilesa, as would be remembered, embarked on a career of conquests even before it had fully established itself in the 11th or 12th century. It became, early in its history, a meeting point of very important trade routes, and grew to become one of the most powerful kingdoms in Yoruba land. Local wars feature strongly in the traditions of this kingdom, wars against the other kingdoms of the Ijesa country. These wars appear to have resulted in the splitting up of some Ijesa royal towns like Emisi and Otan. A section of Emisi migrated up the hills into the Akiti country and founded the Akiti kingdom of Emisi Igbodo, now Okamesi, and a section of Otan moved northeastwards and founded Otan Koto now Otani Igbajo. Igbajo was the most fortunate of these other Ijesa kingdoms. Secure on top of a hill, it was able to resist Ilesa. The power of the Ilesa kingdom reached its peak in the late 17th century in the reign of Ataku Mosa, reputed to be the greatest warrior king of the later eras of Ilesa history. On the whole, although the Ilesa kingdom did not achieve its ambition of making its Oa the ruler of all the Ijesa, it did make the Oa the highly exalted senior brother among the Ijesa kings. The Ilesa kingdom also brought pressure to bear on kingdoms of western Ekiti, notably Ogotan and Afan, in the 17th century. Ifan's location on the hills made repeated aggressions against it futile, but Ogotan appears to have become tributary to Ilesa for some brief period. Like the Ilesa kingdom, the Olawas kingdom of Ouai Pol early developed into a commercially rich and militarily strong state. It was particularly well located to benefit from the trade that flowed from the Ijebu country in its south to the Ife country in the east and the Oyo country in the north. Unlike Kilesa, it dominated its small Ou subgroup from the beginning, so much so that no other kingdom in the Ou country could become anything higher than a subsidiary of the Olau. What such kingdoms lost in independence, however, they gained in wealth and in the pride of being led by the Olau, who was for some time widely regarded as the most powerful king in central Yoruba land. In general, the Ou people gloried in the militarism of the Ou Ipol kingdom and earned, among other Yoruba people, a reputation for aggression, toughness and arrogance. On the younger kingdom of Oyoila in the north, the Olau exerted pressure, forcing Oyoila at some point in its early history to pay tributes. Then when in the 17th century Oyoila became the greatest Yoruba kingdom and the center of a large and expanding empire, the Olawas kingdom became a subsidiary of Oyoila and the Ou people became very proud as the Alafans' foot soldiers in the central forests of Yoruba land. By the 18th century, therefore, the Ou were feared and spitefully spoken of by most of their neighbors the Ife to the east, some of the Igba to the west, and some of the Ijeba to the south. In the Yondo forests, the kingdom of Ape, for reasons that remain unclear, remained small, poor and stagnant. The Idenra kingdom was largely isolated because of its hill location but derived considerable wealth from the trade that flowed through the ancient paths in the valley below its hills. It is not known whether this kingdom ever developed territorial ambitions or some military power. The Osemo's kingdom of Odondo, therefore, controlled almost all the Ondo forests. It became a fairly rich trading and military power, taking advantage especially of trade with the Ikale and Ilhe on the coastal lagoons, and with the Ijebu to the west and southwest, the Owo to the east, and the Ife to the north. Conflicting ambitions over control of the trade routes, exacerbated by uncertainties over territorial boundaries in the deep southern forests, caused this kingdom to get into conflicts from time to time with some of its Ikali neighbors especially, according to Ondo traditions, with such kingdoms as Odai, Ireland the Abode's kingdom of Ikoya. 
Attempts to settle these disputes resulted in a number of negotiated boundary markers and a number of locations in the southern forests. In the Ikale country, the Abodes kingdom of Ikoya seems to have emerged early as the most powerful kingdom. However, the nature of the Ikale country thick forests broken up by lagoons, rivers and swamps compelled each Ikale kingdom to remain fixed in its own forest patch. Much as among the Akiti, the Ikale kings remained a family of equal brothers throughout their history, with hardly any traditions of conflicts among them. In the Igbe country, a certain ebb and flow seems to have characterized the configuration of power among the kings. Over the Gabagura, influence was originally shared about equally by the Agura of Edo and the Onagun of Alugun. In the rivalry between the two, the Agura became gradually more powerful until he finally established influence over the whole of the Gabagura province. Rather than accept the leadership of the Agura, the Onigun ended up attaching his own kingdom to the province of Okona. Among the Igba Agbayan, a similar rivalry won on between the Ojoko of Kesi and the Alek of Ake. The Ojoko was originally the principal king in this province. Conflicts between him and the Alek gradually increased the Alek's influence, until the Alek became the principal king in the province. In Ijebu, the Awujale early became the richest and most powerful king acquiring especially exalted status and influence among the Ijebu kings, as well as certain privileges which no other Ijebu king could claim. Among such privileges may be mentioned the exclusive ownership of Odi, a special kind of court official, and Apabi, a special priest who performs the crowning of the Awujale, and the right to have brought to him from all over Ijebulan the skins and some other parts of certain animals regarded by the Yoruba as royal property such as elephants, bush cows, African buffalo, and leopards. The Awujale also occupied the very influential position of patron of the powerful Osugbo, the Ijebu version of Ogboni, Council of Ijebu Ode, to which all other Osugbu councils in the Ijebu country were subordinate. And he enjoyed the important ritual supremacy of holding certain great and colorful festivals annually, one of which culminated in the gathering in Ijebu Ode once every year of the sixteen Ajemo priests, earth fertility high priests, each accompanied by large numbers of followers, and each bringing a sacred load to bless and to honor the Awujale. In short, then, the Awujale was supreme among the Ijebu kings, and, by and large, he could, whenever there was need to, influence the affairs of all kingdoms in the Ijebu forests. Considering the large expanse and the wealth of the country over which he was thus the most influential ruler, the Awujale would seem to have regularly been the most powerful king in the southern Yoruba forests, and, in the centuries of the greatness of the Alafin, second only to the Alafin in Yoruba land. This political picture in the Ijebu forest would seem to have been generated mostly by the magnitude of trade in the Ijebu country and the nodal position of Ijebu Ode on the overall complex of trade routes in that part of Yoruba land. In Igbamana, the Orangu Navila was generally regarded as the most senior king from the earliest, because of his descent from a line clearly traced to Odudua. However, research by Funso Afalayan, to whom we are indebted for an impressive study of Igbamana history, shows that while the cultural antecedents and political seniority of the Orangun were generally acknowledged all over the Igbamana country, he does not appear to have exercised any form of serious political hegemony over the Igbamana kingdoms before the 19th century. A few of the Igbamana kings, most notably the Alamu of Omuaran and the Alupo of Ajisipio, increasingly came to challenge and threaten whatever paramountcy might have originally been attributed to the Orangun. One important cause of this state of affairs was the constant noop aggression on the Igbamana country, a military pressure which became intensified in the 18th century and resulted in the destruction of Ila. The failure or inability of the Orangun to resist and contain the noop threat weakened his prestige and influence among the Igbamana kings. In this situation, when, during the 17th and 18th centuries, the Oyo Ila kingdom of the Alafin became a great power in northern Yoruba land, some of the Igbamana kings, especially the Alamu of Omuaran and the Alupo of Ajisipio, happily established military alliances and political association with the Alafin, and thus considerably enhanced their power, prestige and influence vis-à-vis -vis that of the Orangun. Migrations and other folk movements Migrations of people in large or small groups, families and individuals, within Yoruba land, were a very important phenomenon in the history of the Yoruba kingdoms and of the Yoruba national society. The primary Kingdom creating, migrations had resulted in the emergence of kingdoms and cities in Yoruba land, and the populations of the cities had been generally enhanced by migrations from their neighboring forests. After these, a second generation of migrations moved significant groups and elements from kingdom to kingdom and imparted what one might call a national flavor to every significant city and kingdom of the Yoruba people. 
a substantial part of the second generation migrations were protest migrations of persons going away from a city where they felt that they had been unfairly denied a royal title or chieftaincy or other position. As earlier pointed out, most leaders of such migrations ended up as chiefs in other cities and kingdoms. Every Yoruba royal city had at least a few such chiefs, always heading quarters constituted by the followers who had come with them. Besides this, Yoruba people seem to have very commonly reacted to disasters, communal troubles, famines, epidemics, etc., by migrating to other parts of their country as individuals, lineages, or even whole settlements. And, moreover, the Yoruba elite in general appear to have been very prone to migrating. It was common that if a famous king ruled over a kingdom, persons of substance and fame came from far and near to live in his city, share in his glory, and contribute to his fame. Kingdoms or kings or other accomplished persons who prospered or became famous usually attracted distinguished persons. This represents a major theme in Yoruba folklore. Such migrants included not only politically ambitious persons but also famous diviners, herbalists, adahunts, providers of occult services, magicians, wise men, and famous women traders, from other royal cities or from provincial towns within the same kingdom or other kingdoms. Typically, such immigrants struck root in their new homes, quite often were offered chieftaincy titles, and entered into high offices of state. All over Yoruba land. There are stories of rich women who married king after king across the country and had children for some, and thus became famous. It was common for the most distinguished professionals to spend their professional lives migrating all over the Yoruba homeland, living a few years in each place and then moving on. Such persons were the icons of the Yoruba National Society. If they were Babalawo or medicine men or wise men, they usually left groups of their disciples in many cities. One of such men, according to Adeo Bayami, was Atakun Mosa the 17th century Ilesa prince who in later life became king of Ilesa. A renowned medicine man, Atakun Mosa lived in many towns Akol, Ara, Adu, Ikir, Akure before he was crowned king of Ilesa. When he left Ilesa as a result of disagreement with his subjects, he spent some more years abroad, during which time he lived briefly in Benin, Owo, and Akure, before he was invited back to his throne. According to certain traditions, a sort of national summit meeting was held periodically, at fixed intervals of perhaps seven or eight years, by the highest and best of wise men from all over Yoruba land. According to Chief Isola Fabian Miavife, the general populace, only faintly aware of these summit meetings, commonly fearfully spoke of them as gatherings of witches and wizards. The typical agenda of such meetings appear to have been exchanges and demonstrations of esoteric knowledge and power, 